everyone. Welcome to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hussey. So we, this is the show that gives you the tools, the, the tips, um, and it also shares the stumbling blocks to the writing process. And also, we're trying to give you information from the industry perspective, which is rarely seen. So, and we're going to try and cover all of that and everything in between so that basically we're giving you the information that you need to make getting your book on the shelf a little bit less of a scary process. Um, remember, we are live on Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern, so click to subscribe below to be alerted ahead of every episode. So, we're going to introduce the process today of what happens after you get an agent. So, it's, you know, we've discussed that people act like the moment they get an agent, that's it, everything's fine, and there's there's no work left to be done. But of course we know that that's not true. So what happens next? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's a very broadly assumed process, and I'm coming at it from the writer's and the author's perspective, which is what happens, because basically, you know, what we see is the end kind of result when everybody's talking about, yay, I got an agent, and then you don't hear anything, and then a book is on the shelf, and there's a book tour, and there, there's a big celebration about it, which is super exciting, but it's really hard for a writer or, you know, to, to kind of look at it and go, okay, I know exactly what's happening, it's a bit of a mystery, it's a little bit intimidating. So sometimes I wonder if writers are a bit put off by the whole process because they're a bit like, oh God, you know, this is like a huge thing. And if I don't get one, then I, my work means nothing. So, you know, I think there's probably a multi-layered process, which is why I'm gonna hand it over to you because you you see it from the industry side. And it'd be great to kind of get a little bit more information about that. Sure, I think there's, um, this is the reason that we need you know that we uh, we need other people to to come and talk to us because this is the this represents a big gap between both of our both of our knowledge. I think um, I you know you know what happens before and then I know what happens after well after but then there's this middle bit um, because of course I've been on the receiving end of submissions um, I've seen them as they come in but you know typically in in my role I would see maybe you know a part or a whole of a manuscript and then depending on the author data. Right, so other information about them, um, what their social media following looks like, what kind of platforms they have, what their website uh, URL is, you know, it was my, you know, my job to kind of dig in and see what potential these people had in terms of marketability, right, and, you know, and uh, what work authors had already done to establish themselves. Um, and a lot of that comes in the initial submission from the agent and the author that, you know, those, those sort of jumping off points for you to look into. Um, you know, and if, if it's impressive, of course, a submission comes along <laughs> with that information. Yeah. You know, and that's sort of what we've talked about a little bit about in some other episodes, which is that you want to have a footprint before you get to this point. Yeah. Because, you know, those success in those in those areas, uh, in social media, in, you know, in media can, you know, contribute to your, your relevance, how seriously you're taken um, in those, you know, hyper important first impression moments, basically, you know, where, where your desired publisher is receiving all this information about you. So, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to have seen lots of examples of what agents and authors eventually put together, but not necessarily know much about how they go about putting that together. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a largely mysterious kind of process. And I think, you know, I, I just wonder how many then hoops the agent has to go through. They can believe in something, but what if nobody wants it? Then, then like maybe the process starts again. So as an author, you're pitching your body of work. So then when an agent sees it and likes it and thinks that it will sell, then it's like they take on the work almost as an author does, which is, okay, now I'm going to have to pitch it to, to people that I want to sell it to. And then how, you know, it must be, 
the, you know, the process must be really not only frustrating, but complicated, you know, and how much time does that take for each author? I sure. can imagine, you know, sure. I would, I mean, it's my understanding that there is a bit of a thrill when you kind of match those two things up, right? When you yeah. take what has come in from an author and you know, you know, the person, you know, the editor and the publisher who needs to see this. Yeah. Part, you know? uh, and I think for agents, that's, that's exactly, you know, that's, that's what they were there for. That's what they want to do. And that's what you want them to do for you. You know, their knowledge of editors and imprints and publishers is beyond anything that you as a writer could know on your own, right? Yeah. And that's your bridge to getting your book on the shelf. And, yeah. you know, it's their responsibility to know when editors change houses, what their lists look like, what books they're acquiring at the moment. That might be different from what they were doing two years ago. Um, you know, what the structure of the company looks like, who the editor reports to. There, There is so much nuance there. And so, so many personal relationships that need to exist for you to be able to have all of that information that, you know, that's the, that's the really interesting part that happens next with an agent. You know, an example I'm thinking of is your, your agent will know the ins and outs of or should know <laughs> the ins and outs of <laughs> you know, bidding bidding rules within a house you know typically um if you have lots Ooh. of publishers within one, one publishing company you know there I've, I've you know i've worked at companies where absolutely everyone was free to bid against each other um and then i've worked in other ho houses where it absolutely was not okay and you know stuff like that would have to go through the in, that's sorry to interrupt. But that's completely new information. I think somebody like me, yeah, who's going to represent the creative side. That's fascinating. I had no idea that there were rules. I thought it was a bit. <laughs> my idea is a bit like it's Wild West, right. you know? <laughs> holding, up, holding up paddles, going like, oh, I want it. I want it. Right. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of publishers handle it differently. It changes. You know, it's it's it can be really fluid. Uh, as publishers acquire other other publishing companies, you know, sometimes you'll have relationships where everyone is quite close and they're all in the same building and it's handled one way. And then other times, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, you'll be a publisher in New York who owns a smaller, smaller company in San Francisco and it might work a little bit differently because they maintain more autonomy, right, over their lists and, you know, and it's not, it's not entirely the same. So there's yeah. lots of nuance there. There are a lot of things <laughs> that happen yeah in companies that have nothing, as you know, as we've talked about before, have nothing to do with the writing. They have absolutely nothing to do with the content of what is what is coming coming out of you as a writer. And that's one of the things, you know, that that you really, really lean hard on an agent for and yeah. you know, why having a partnership with an agent puts you in a much more favorable position. Yeah. You know, in, in uh, and because it's so out of your hands, I'm approaching it again, like from a slightly more emotional point of view, which is that must be slightly alien to kind of say, right, well, kind of you're handling my future at this point. Mm -hmm. You don't have really much to say about it because it's completely out of your control and kind of out of the agent's control to a degree. So you don't really know what will happen I think probably both both the author and the agent just have their fingers crossed and be like, well, <laughs> let's let's try and manifest, you know. But yeah, I'm sure, a lot of a lot of that you know exists because you can't, as we've discussed before. I mean, there's there is an element of luck and kind yeah. of right place, right time um, to a lot of this. Uh, that said, that is not to take away at all from what an agent does and yeah. how they can, you know, sort of navigate the luck aspect, you know, they're, they are, uh, it's their job to strategize around these things. And again, to maintain these relationships so that there is no, you know, or there's as little as possible guesswork um, I, in, in what someone, you know, might be acquiring at the moment and what they're looking for. It's, you know, yeah. they're on it. I think it's really interesting to position mentally position the agent almost in parallel as the author mm -hmm. 
you know, because they are doing kind of similar things to what you were doing. So I was saying before the kind of the stages that you go through when you submit, then the agent goes through those stages to submit, you know, to a publisher. So yep. I think what people, I don't think many people kind of see it that way. They see an agent taking on something and then snapping their fingers and going, look, here's a six figure deal and um, movie rights. And you know what I mean? So I think, you know, it's, it's, I think it would be great for people to see it in those kind of ways. It's so much more human and more kind of the nuts and bolts that agents have to deal with in order to get your book seen by publishers to believe in it. You know, of course, I mean, even after this, you know, this part of the process, which is, you know, going from uh, agent to publisher, then of course, mm -hmm. once you secure a publisher or, you know, or, or begin to take those, those more serious steps. I mean, as we've talked about before, then you get into contract negotiations and all, all, all sorts of other details that again, that's another, another part of their skill set that may not be part of yours. Um, probably as a creative, probably is not at all part of yours. <laughs> I can barely balance my bank account. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> you know, that's that's the next the next thing that they will really guide guide you through. So yeah. it's you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of heavy lifting, it's a lot of hard work and it's uh it's I think I think it's a a really impressive skill set to have. Um yeah. to to work with creative people, to be able to work with business people, to again, and I, I keep using the word bridge, um, but that's truly what it. That's truly what it is. And they, you know, they are the person who is going to, you know, bring you together with 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 your dream, really, you know, with with the publisher, um, and you know, part of that is you finding that person yeah. that you really work well with and who does kind of exact, exactly what you're saying, right? It would, you know, in that the process is then mirrored, right? And you need to feel like that person is going to be your person. You need to feel like that is what they then present is going to be true and a true and honest representation of what you put out there. Yeah, and you need to feel complete confidence in that. So, you know, it's it's an important thing, like we've said a few times now, to to find the right person, and yeah. feel like they are they're going to take your work, and the the whole next part of the process is going to is going to be what you hope it to be. Yeah, and we can ask more of those questions in a more detailed way from our special guest Julia in a minute, but first, let's talk about a book for our What Makes This Book Great. So, Yay! Oh, hidden a bit, <laughs> that's a big cover. <laughs> but why? Um, so The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein was first published by Harper and Rowe in 1964. Uh, I remember it well. Um, just kidding. Uh, my parents weren't even married. Uh, <laughs> You're not that old. <laughs> no. Uh, most of the most of the books we've talked about up to this point, have, you know, had been published in modern memory, but this one reaches back to before I think either of us were, were born. Um, you know, and still remains successful today, and is truly a children's classic. Shel Silverstein wrote many books and collections of poems for children, which greatly shaped my life as a young reader. Uh, so this is this is very special. So Tatiana, as a writer, tell us what makes this book great. I love this book so much. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's just, it has like every single time I read it, it just astounds me with how mo moving it is on so many different levels. It has absolutely everything in it in just a, a handful of pages. Mm -hmm. But again, this section isn't a book review. What, for me, what makes this book extraordinary is that nobody wanted it. No, <laughs> nobody, nobody wanted it. I'm amazed that people didn't see 
how beautifully simple the message comes across. It's about, I mean, kindness is so trite to say, but it's about generosity of spirit. It's about, you know, childhood being messy and complicated. It's about taking care of the planet. It's about not being entitled. It's, I mean, there are so many things that people can take away from this. And yet, nobody wanted it. Yeah. Publishers turned it down. That to me, I mean, it's one of the long list of like so many famous books that have been turned down, but come on, how? How do you say no to something so sweet? Right? I think, uh, again, it, you know, it, it harkens back to a lot of the things that we've talked about, which is uh, it, that maybe people were not ready for gray areas, right? People weren't, it was not safe to publish something that was not completely straightforward and saccharine and, you know, especially in children's children's publishing in 1960. Yeah. Uh, so it's that, you know, that concept I think now seems a given to us that we would have, you know, children's books that maybe have, you know, sort of double entendres and, you know, really subtle messaging below um, what is, you know, the literal words that are on the page. But then that was still a bit, you know, still still a bit iffy and people were not necessarily willing to take the chance on that. That's wild. I mean, it's just like, I, I mean, I cry at commercials. So, yeah. but but that, that book in particular, every time I read it, I just love it so much. And it's just, I think it also just goes to show you that it doesn't matter what other people say necessarily. You just have to keep going with something that really just moves you. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Shell did. Yeah. I mean, he just, he kept pushing for something that meant so much to him and probably meant, I just wonder kind of the backstory to that, which is I'm sure a lot of people read his, that book and said, oh my gosh, you have to do something with it. You know, he loved it. And I think eventually kind of people see that. So I think that's one of those many tales of, you know, books that were rejected. Yeah. And for people to kind of remind themselves that actually, if you believe in something, at some point it will get its moment. You know, it's amazing uh, that that it still is a classic, right? It's still it is. You know, it's extremely successful now still. And yeah, I think certainly just the fact that a book like that has kept the same jacket since it was originally published. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll often see publishers change covers or series looks for well-loved authors who are perennial classics, you know, to keep kind of keeping things fresh and, you know, and changing yeah. that to look, you know, to look modern and to, to fit on a shelf with other things that, that, you know, look more like it. This one's never changed, you know, it's that, that classic green cover with his illustrations, you know, totally stayed the course, which is part of actually what makes it stand out so much now, um, despite not looking out of place at all. Like, there's nothing about, you know, there's nothing about it that looks out of place as a children's book or would, would, would you know, stand out as strange on a shelf. So I think that's that's interesting. And, you know, one of the other things that we've, we've talked about a lot in terms of success in publishing is, you know, there, there are different ways to look at this book, right? And I am of the mind, um, I, I, I share share your opinion that it is truly about unconditional love, right? Selfless. Love. Yeah. Um, you know, but then there is, of course, this other other way of looking at it that quite a lot of people hold, which is that it's you know this selfish child taking from a loved one, and I, just that alone, again, it's a talking point, it's a discussion, it's something that people feel you know truly sure about um, with you know within their souls, so want to talk about it and you know when you have a polarizing topic or you have something that can be interpreted in two different ways you know again people keep talking about it it keeps being relevant yeah oh such a good one i love show right. let's bring on our guest julia silk yes. who's a literary agent who probably would never have said no to something like the giving tree right let's bring her on Hey, hi. Hello. Hello. So I'm going to introduce you now. Uh, so we've come to this episode's full disclosure moment. Uh, Julia is my work wife. Um, we shared <laughs> it for years. Um, our shared boss sold her on me as the American version of her. Um, 
Uh, and it was not uncommon for us to show up to the office wearing matching outfits. I know we <laughs> this is this is true. Yes, we have. I think at least two pairs of the same the same shoes, um, which that, that is a compliment to Julia. Julia has amazing shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many shoes. <laughs> Uh, so when we met, though we didn't know it then, Julia was putting a cap on her 18-year career as an editor, right, both in-house and freelance, and she was about to embark on her next career as an agent. So she first uh, she first worked as part of MBA Literary Agents and is currently part of the team at Kingsford Campbell, where she represents a wide range of literary and commercial fiction, as well as nonfiction in the areas of health, well-being, lifestyle, and memoir. She is drawn to character and voice-driven stories with a pitchable hook. And her clients include Charlotte Philby, Owen Booth, and Maisie Hill. So we've talked previously on the show, Julia, about how a writer goes about getting an agent. Um, and obviously they would be blessed to find their way to you. <laughs> and Julia is going to tell us what happens next. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of a, a, approaching it from writers who have just finished, polished up, like as best they can their manuscript and they're going through the scary process of submitting what happens from your end what happens when you know because we we hear the kind of the celebration of like oh my goodness i get an agent and then you know months down the line suddenly the book is out on shelves and people are doing book tours maybe not now but <laughs> um you know so what what happens? What 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 are the steps that happen once you see something and you're like, yes, okay, I believe in this. I hear a voice. This is something good. Um, well, so it slightly depends how I've come across it because sometimes, like you say, they've polished it up and they sent it to a bunch of agents and um, or you know, and that's and for me, that's often in in fiction, in nonfiction, often it's the sort of the, the pursuit of uh, people that I'm already interested in, maybe they're journalists or maybe I've seen them on Instagram, whatever. But really it's, it's kind of always the same thing in that I kind of will read their work and ask to um, have a conversation with them if I think I would be interested in representing them. We always have a conversation then about maybe if they're talking to other people um, about what they're looking for. I always want to know, you know, what is it that you want out of this? What do you want to happen next? How do you want to be represented? And sometimes they'll, they'll be incredibly knowledgeable. Maybe they've been, you know, this is maybe the third or fourth book they've had out because that quite often happens. Sometimes they've, you know, they've come to a point maybe after several years where they've realized that actually this is the one, this is the book that's ready. Maybe the previous books weren't ready. Um, and sometimes I had a conversation with someone today um, in uh, the in nonfiction. She's thinking about writing a memoir. And it was the first, she, she said she's just begun to think of herself as a writer. And she has not even dipped a toe in the water. So she had no idea about really anything. Yeah. So, um, you know, often you're coming from a different starting point. Um, then when we get to the point that we're, you know, we've sort of established what it is that they're looking for, what, what it is they would like to happen next. Um, you know, then they've got a decision to make. Uh, it's a mutual thing. You know, it's, agents don't hold all the cards. It's a two way street. You know, sometimes you'll be in competition with several other agents. Sometimes it's just you. Sometimes they meet you and they say, you know what, I just think this will be great. And we work brilliantly together let's just go for it and sometimes they really feel like it's a bit of an agonizing choice and they're really torn and they like everybody and who do they pick so you kind of go through that process and I generally try to just be as transparent as possible I'll always say look you know I can send you our client agreement you can see because the any reputable agency will belong to the association of authors agents in the UK um, and there's best practice and we all adhere to that. So what you're going to get in terms of commission that, you know, that your agent would take and how they would represent you would be um, kind of similar on paper, but everyone's got a different style. So there are as many different, you know, authors, some authors want, a, they want a rock viola, they want someone who they think seems tough and scary, even if they're also scared of them. Um, and some people really, really don't. I mean, my first client said to me that she turned down representation 
a little while earlier from someone else who she knew was a really good, really reputable agent, but she just knew that every time she went to pick up the phone, she'd be scared. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, so everyone wants something different. Yeah, because you could never be scared of it. <laughs> Do you yeah, I'm not sorry. I just turned it. Sorry, I realized that you were on really quiet. So I've just turned you up. There we go. <laughs> do you do you find it exhausting that you if you, for example, like you see somebody that you really want to work with and they are then dealing with their own decisions? Do you find it frustrating or exhausting when you think, oh, but I have you had those moments where you're like, oh, but I really, really want to work with this person and I, I really like that story. Then if it doesn't happen, like, you know, is that, do you just, is it hard to move on to the kind of the next if you really hope for something or is that something you're used to now? Um, that's a really good question and it's not something I think people would even know was a thing. Um, so uh, it, it's, you know, I've been an agent for four years now, and um, it is a roller coaster. But I, and it's sort of about. It's like, sometimes it can really be about how you feel that day and how things have been going that month. Sometimes you know, it's always difficult, yes, to let go of a really great story or someone that you've really liked and connected with, and you know that they liked you and connected with you as well. And and I think that's the that's the thing is to not take it personally because it isn't that you weren't good or that you or that they didn't like you or they didn't think you could do a job good job for them um, usually. Uh, and I think you know as time has gone on I, I I take it it feels less and less personal personal so sort of in my head I always knew it wasn't personal but now in my heart you know I, I don't I don't take it as personally it yeah. isn't as devastating um and it, it partly it also then <laughs> I'm, I'm only human it partly depends on how well they then go on to do <laughs> <laughs> to an extent. but then sometimes you know you just end up connecting with somebody who's really lovely and sort of becomes part of your network and actually I, I can think of one particular author who's non-fiction um and I went and I met her we had a great time you know we were standing on the corner of the street after our meeting and she was pretty much signing up there and then and then she met someone else she had one more meeting she met someone else and she said I've decided to go with them because they come from a particular type of agency. They and she has other strings to her bow, and she felt that they mm -hmm. there were certain areas in which they could potentially, you know, do more for her. And actually, I just think she's a great person. We 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 still frequently connect over social media. You know, she's she's friendly with some of my authors. She supports their book. We you know their books. We support her book. And actually, it's almost like at that point you've gone beyond, and they've just you know. Yeah. And I think actually it's. So such a small world and so many people are interconnected and so many times I've, I've often have people come to me who've been recommended you know I've been met, recommended to them by someone who I've met but maybe who decided to go with someone else and so I know that they genuinely did think I was great they just decided to go with someone else for whatever reason so I think you know agents often do take these things just as personally as authors do it's just you know it's one of those secrets things that no one talks about i love that and marissa actually marissa did compare it in a in a previous episode to a tinder <laughs> yeah you know because what's interesting is that what what is what exists are kind of parallel experiences almost i think which many writers don't understand or they don't see that side and i think it's really fascinating when the the you know, that's kind of revealed from the agent side or the industry side. Cause like everybody's trying to work towards the path that they are most comfortable with the path that they kind of, that will celebrate their own kind of work, you know? So I, I think it's great when that's revealed because, because it kind of demystifies the process. It makes it more relatable. Mm. Know? and and I, I do think but when you started that story I was like oh my god it's like a date that suddenly <laughs> it's just oh no <laughs> and, you kind of, and it's okay to let yourself feel a bit heartbroken for a few days as well and and it also depends you know if I if it's happened in a week where I don't know one of my 
books has been a thriller of the month or you know some oh I've just sold something quite big then I feel like it's like oh okay you know there's more where that came from and if it's a week where I haven't sold anything for two months and um you know one of my books didn't get into a supermarket I'm like oh just never get another author again you know so <laughs> And then, so Marissa, do you want to ask about like what happens kind of then contract wise and stuff? So, Sorry, I've been talking so much. Of... <laughs> so you have agreed, right, on your partnership with with someone. You've come together. The Tinder date has has gone. You know, the first date has gone very well. Um, so how do you then start working and crafting your submission for publishers? Okay, well, equally that depends on whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and it also depends. You know, I could do anything from five or six drafts editorially uh, before something's ready to go out or I, I've actually just um, taken on a new client quite recently um, and he, I'll be sending um, his book out next week and it almost needed nothing which I find quite disconcerting I think what what have I missed oh, no, I just lost my touch but, um, but it was very polished and he'd he'd been working very hard I mean he it's the fifth or sixth novel he's written and he hadn't really ever felt any of them were good enough so he had he's a you know he's really studied the craft I think um and is a is a very good self-editor and he'd also used an editorial consultant actually um to, to work on the book with that doesn't always mean it's going to be polished to the point where I wouldn't think it needed work but just in this case um it has been and I'm trying to remember what the question was oh yes so um and likewise you know with non-fiction if it's uh, practical, factual thing in the US generally they refer to it as prescriptive nonfiction. Um, then again the the proposal could be really quite well fleshed out and it in quite good shape um, and then it would just be tweaking or it could be really about a thing that still you know requires quite a lot of work and is a is still a sort of evolving um, but I so but just to step Back, take back one step. Even before I take someone on, I always explain what I think the process is going to be for them. Broadly, though, I would just generally explain what the process is. Um, and then, so yes, yeah, so there's the editorial work, um, and then we talk about. Uh, who, and we and again, all these things are happening in sort of an overlapping way. But we talk about who who we who I think it should go out to, and I discuss like why I think that, and how many editors, you know, whether I, there are any that I'm holding back in case I think we might need to do a second round. Um, and I always kind of say. I mean, I do think that there are a few books where you feel as an agent kind of this is that this is probably a no brainer. You know, this is going to sell. It's just going to sell. You just know you have that faith. And, and actually, some agents work in the way that they never take something on. that They don't they aren't pretty sure they can sell. Mm -hmm. And I don't work like that. I like to take a le leap of faith and I like to kind of experiment a bit. And I like to work with things that are maybe a little bit not you know, obvious. And sometimes they sell and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they take a year to sell. Um, and sometimes it's the second one that sells. And I always say to people, you know, and even if I do think it's a no brainer, I always say, there's no guarantee. But here's what I do if something doesn't sell. I say, you know, we might, depending on what the feedback is, we might, we might do some reworking that there's a kind of, and when I say, I, I don't, I hesitate to call it a B list, because it makes it sound like I think those aren't good publishers. But I think, you know, you do want to, kind of generally go for the bigger publishers because you're probably going to get more money you're probably going to get a bigger budget you know and, it, and it's business at the end of the day it, it has to be but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't end up actually having a really great start to an author's career and being able to build that author really well and really successfully if you start with one of the ma many absolutely incredible small independent presses who can't pay very much up front they can do amazing things for an author and and sometimes some authors can actually get a bit lost in bigger publishers. And that's not just in if they're a bigger publisher, but they're not a big author for that publisher. That can also be if they have a huge advance for two books and, and expectations aren't met because it's always, you know, the higher the expectations, the harder they are to meet. So I guess that's a very long answer to that question. But I think exactly what, exactly what we were looking for. Yeah. Well, I have one, I have one more um, that I think I think is interesting. So I think uh, what, one of the things that we're trying to do right is demystify right what happens in publishing and getting and getting your book published. And you know, as Tetjana had said, lots of people think you get an agent that means that you have a six-figure deal. It's massive. It's all, you know, it's 
it gets reported, you know, in in the industry press. It's it's always huge. We know that, of course, not every book has that has that life cycle, and that's not that's not the story. So, how do you strategize how a book gets presented? Right. For example, right. How does it differ? How you go to publishers when you expect the standard bidding right process, and it's a you know it's a it's a fairly straightforward book as a you know, as opposed to one that you think genuinely there may be a lot of hype around and it might be an intense bid process, you know, it might be over a few days. I think it's really, it might be really interesting for people to hear about how you, yeah. how you handle or just anecdotally yeah. how some, you know, stories about how. Well, uh, you know, sometimes you can get taken by surprise. So sometimes that agents will set a date, you know, and expect that there's going to be, and they've had a lot of interest. So, so before we send something out, we, we'll always have, you know, we won't necessarily have talked about it to all, I don't know, 12, 14, whatever editors we're sending it to. But in the course of our working lives, we're constantly talking to editors and keeping up to date with them. And, you know, we used to have coffee with them. Now we have Zoom coffee with them, whatever, or drinks, whatever. We, we're always talking about our projects. So, you know, out of maybe if I'm sending something to say 12 editors, I might have already talked about it in person to a few of them um, or, uh, way before. Um, and then sometimes I will have had a, 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 you know, I often like to try and speak to as many of them as possible just to sort of do a little pitch over the phone before I send it to them, like a couple of days before. I send it to them to, to let them know it's coming so that they it just kind of ho hopefully pushes it up the pile i mean so you can't always predict what's going to happen because sometimes you set a date and there is there is no auction i mean i don't actually tend to do that i think there are some there are a few agents who almost everything they send out goes to auction but actually you know i think there's this misconception that there's always a bidding process i mean a lot of things i just send out and if I don't hear back in a few weeks, I say, it would be great to hear your thoughts, you know, and I'm having constant conversations about it. But if I say, um, I want to hear from everybody by such and such a date, and no one's got back to me by then, and I say that's the deadline, then I look a bit foolish when I go, oh, actually, you can all have, you know, <laughs> a definite amount of time to look at it. I only set a date when I'm really sure. Sure. Best case scenario, I suppose, was something I sent out last summer where I knew there was going to be lots of interest and um, she she just had such a clear proposition and there was so obviously, you know, a need for this book. And I talked to a few editors about it and they were really excited about it. And I think I initially sent it to like 14 editors and I very quickly added another three or four because I just thought, well, the more the merrier, um, even though I knew I was going to sell it on the bait. And by the time, so obviously it takes a little while to send out, you know, 14 emails. You're always double checking them and tweaking them a bit. And by the uh, by the time I, I hit send on the 14th editor, three of them had already emailed me and said, I'm taking it to acquisitions next week. <laughs> I mean, it was a proposal. So obviously, it was a very quick thing to read. It wasn't like they were sitting there reading a, you know, 100,000 word novel. Um, so uh, that's great. And then you and I do and I'd already set a deadline on that one anyway. Um, but uh so i think so so i would say for me the difference is that i i, I kind of either set a deadline or i don't mm -hmm. yeah um and it's kind of that simple and actually you know some there are a few agents maybe i don't know five to ten percent of agents where you know as soon as something comes in for them for them everyone gets in a flap yeah. and that's partly to do with you know their own kind of branding um, and and the, the area that they work in as well. You know, if you're an agent that does a lot of um, literary fiction, then, you know, you just don't, it, it, there's, a, there's that reading group sweet spot, high, reading group high concept sweet spot, where you are always going to get a lot of competition for a book. It doesn't make it a better book. It's just, that's what editors are, it's, it's the easiest thing to sell. Yeah. Um, but then when you work with really literary things, sometimes it's, you know, they, they can be quite Marmite. So you don't necessarily expect everyone. You think, well, either people are going to love it or they're going to hate it or who knows, you know. Yeah. Um, and I do work with authors like that. So I don't really have a, oh, is it going to be a, a is it going to be gentle bidding or a frenzy of bidding? It's more like, is there going to uh, is there going to be more than one editor interested in this or not? Yeah. You know, and so I kind of that's the judgment I tend to make. Yeah, that's, that's really great. It keeps it nice and kind of clean and simple. I think that's kind of how, probably how you kind of best manage your time as well, because the last yeah. thing is to be, you know, hanging around like a headless chicken either. 
Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. And kind of not being able to meet your author's expectations then. And actually to go back to what you were saying about, you know, people go, oh, I've got an agent, you know, this is great. I do have this thing, this little riff that I do, which is every aspect of this process is not an end, it's a beginning. Yeah. And people think, oh, it's so exciting, I've got an agent. And then they don't, and they're really excited when they're working on it with you and, and editing it. And it feels all so positive. And, and of course you feel, you know, hopeful and optimistic about it otherwise you wouldn't have taken it on um but then you know the tension of being out on submission it's incredibly nerve-wracking and then you've got people interested and then they buy it and then there's all these expectations and then so it's a bit like when you're um arranging a wedding it's really exciting at the beginning and you pick the venue and you might buy your dress and then if it's a year ahead and nothing happens at all for six months <laughs> so you know but the publishers have wooed you and they bought the book and it's really fantastic and then they don't <laughs> really need to you know that, then they'll start editing with you but then often there's a big gap if sometimes it's a year and a half away so they'll, they'll be excited and they'll you know take you for lunch and they'll do the editing process with you and then nothing really happens for sort of three or four months until the proofs are ready to look at um and that can kind of be a little bit weird. And, and a lot of what you do as an agent is uh, uh, is kind of that sort of hand-holding and, and kind of talking about the next idea, maybe, you know, it, and it's different also if the book's just a one-book deal or a two-book deal, because if it's a two-book deal, then the author's just getting on with their next book. Yeah. Um, and depending on how much input you have as an agent depends on really who the editor is and what the relationship is like. So it can be loads of, input or almost none depending on how the editor likes to work and what kind of book it is and how developed the idea was before you sold this second book I mean sometimes I sell a second book and no one actually knows what the book's going to be sometimes <laughs> the second book that I sell in that you know if it's a two book deal the second book in the contract is already a kind of actually it's going to be this so yeah. there's also that um and then actually it's quite interesting because this well i think it's interesting um <laughs> i i i've always loved memoir i've been interested in memoir and it's part of my list that i've wanted to develop and has been developing quite quickly in the last few months um and of course memoir as opposed to autobiography memoir is the difference between memoir and autobiography is autobiography is usually sort of about m most of your life memoir is about a part of your life a specific usually about a specific aspect of, of your life and sometimes that can be something that has been quite painful or traumatic and actually you know the editor has different concerns from the agent the editor is what however sort of nurturing and wonderful and great the editor is they're working for the publisher but the agent is working for the author so yeah. actually you know, even with my authors, you've got a great relationship with their editor. They don't want to mess that up or spoil it. It's, it's a bit, it's the difference between being a friend and being, you know, a, and having that friend has other concerns and being maybe, I don't know, a sibling or I don't think it should be like a parent-child relationship, but I suppose I would compare it to, it's almost like the agent is expected to give and to, to have and offer unconditional love. Whereas <laughs> the editor, you know, they don't want to bother their editor because they don't want to like piss them off. Mm -hmm. um, but they know that the that the agent is that that's your job your job is to hold their hand and, and nurture them and reassure them um and that is a really you know that's a part of the job that i really love because i want my authors to feel reassured and secure in what they're doing so and i think something about memoir because it's so personal because you can feel so exposed when you're writing it often authors that are writing memoir kind of need that aspect of the relationship yeah. more than maybe some others do of course i mean honestly that all of this information is just so helpful and i mean it's so wonderfully generous to kind of share that because i think you've covered so much of what you do in such a and i keep using the word human but you know what i mean it's like it's so, it's just really helpful for people who kind of can see it now kind of a little bit more from the other side and I love that you ended on that note, which is like the, just the nurturing that you do and the work that you do for, you know, for your authors. I think it's brilliant. Um, before we end this segment, two questions. One of them is if you weren't doing your job, if you weren't a literary agent, what would you be doing? It's funny that you should say that because I actually got asked that question on a, an interview um, ages ago. And um, I don't know that it's what I would be doing because I don't have the skills, but what I would love to be is a, uh, and to have the skills to be is um, a dressmaker. 
I just oh, think it's magical. And actually, it's funny because I, I think Jemima, who was on last time, is quite a talented uh, seamstress herself. Oh. Um, so, uh, yeah, I should have kind of got onto that before I had kids and just didn't have time to do anything apart from my job and look after <laughs> my children. Uh, but I just think it's mag I just think it's magical and I love clothes and, and I love what they can do for you and how they can make you feel. Oh, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, and my last question is Desert Island Book. Mm, it's weird that one because I know I can say what some of my favorite books are but I don't know if they're the ones that I would but that's different from one that you would want to read over and over again have on a desert island with you oh that's really tough what do I keep coming back to I love a uh, collection by an author who is who is kind of um criminally not that well known called Maeve Brennan, who is an Irish writer who um, her father, I think he was a diplomat, I'm trying to remember now, uh, they moved to the States when she was about 17 and she worked for the New Yorker and she was incredibly glamorous and it's believed that um, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany, what's Holly Go Lightly? Uh, it was based on her. And she wrote um, a novella and uh, a kind of couple of books of sort of story cycles and one of them is called The Rose Garden and it is um, among the kind of wealthy people of New York and I love those stories so much and I always find something different in them whenever I read them I need to read them again I haven't read them for a couple of years actually um, so probably that because I know that I can read them again and again cool oh this is a uh, Great answer, great episode, Julia. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've had fun. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We're going to say bye. <laughs> that was just great. I mean, honestly, like the amount of helpful information, I think it's just kind of makes a huge difference, you know? Uh, and I think. That's all we want to try and do to everybody who's watching. I think, you know, it just, it really demystifies the process when we give the information from both sides. And it's not as scary as some people think. And I think, you know, there, there's so much work on both sides that has to be done and so many layers to getting a book published or even just writing a book. Like it's all such an immense process that I think this has been really fun. Yeah. Right, so that ends this episode of The Craft and Business of Books. Remember, we are live, and sometimes not, every Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, remember to click to subscribe, and that's it from us. So thank you for being here. See you next week. <laughs>